Sophie, Sophie, Sophie. Good morning, everyone. Welcome here in um, the Fellowship of the Believers this morning. We've got a few new people, Jock, I heard. And you only arrived on Thursday. Wow. You have to work gently with him this morning. He's so <laughs> jet lag. Welcome here, Jock. We ha and if there's anything that you need, please talk to us. We're all here to help. We know that this is a very big step. And it's a, a big change in all of, of your lives. So please do not be ashamed or to ask for help or anything or just to chat to us. We are there for you. And then we also say hi to Lucas. And now I forgot your name. David. Um, that's joining us this morning. It's good to have you here. So uh, you'll see I remember the kids' names, but I, I'm not so good with the grown-ups. <laughs> so it's good that we are here this morning. Let's just pray together and say thank you for this privilege. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that we have, that we can be here in your midst. And Holy Spirit, thank you that we can trust you to, to speak to each of us in this morning, to open our hearts, to open our minds, so that we will clearly understand your message. We praise your name. Amen. I forgot to say we are happy to see Jan is here with us this morning. He had a, an accident, a, was in a bit of an accident this weekend, or this week. And it's good to see that you're well enough to be here with us, Jan. Let's stand and praise the Lord when we sing, This is Amazing Grace. And then directly after that, we're going to sing, Hosanna, Praise is Rising. Please stand and join us when we worship. <coughs> breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King above all kings Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place
is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy This is amazing grace This is going to continue our praise as we glorify the Lord with our thanks offering. So uh, let's see this as a part of the service where we also dedicate ourselves and thank Him um, with this token for, for His love and um, for all His provision.
so used to the thing on my head. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, we thank you. We glorify you and we praise you for everything you have done and for everything you do for us. Especially in this time of the year where we can uh, just remember and rejoice in the fact that you have r been risen. That you are alive and that you are, are there for us. And thank you that we could also now just give something from us to you. And we pray that you would use that to the building of your kingdom and the glorification of your name. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Guy. <coughs> so as a song of, of dedication and worship, let's sing the song at the cross before we carry on with uh, the sermon. Um, after that, there will be a short video as a, as a kid's moment, um, but I will do a prayer in between. So let's stand and let's sing at the cross. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever Comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross, at the cross, I surrender.
may be seated. And let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, we are standing in awe of you and your love. The self-sacrificing love that did not hold back and protect yourself, but surrendered to the will of the Father by giving up yourself. And now we can have life everlasting and meaning in living. We thank you. We glorify you. And as we've sung earlier, we, we welcomed you in this meeting, but now we realize it's actually you that are welcoming us in your presence, and we thank you for that. And thank you that you made it possible through the cross and by, by overcoming death, by being risen, so that we know that we, that we are serving a living God, our Lord Jesus. And as we are together here in your presence, we pray that you would, that you would grow that faith, that you would help us to cling to that faith, the knowledge that you have done everything that we need if only we would surrender and accept that and live according to and through your love. Dear Lord, thank you. But as we are together here, we also thank you for, for people that could join us today and that we can bless them, especially we think about, uh, I think it's Jack that, that has just arrived. We pray that you would also help him to, to find his feet here in Perth in Australia, and that you would really bless him and help him. Dear Lord, we, we also thank you that we can, can pray for the second half of this holiday, that people will still enjoy, the, especially the children at home, that they will still enjoy it, and that you would help all the households in the practicalities about that, but give them a good rest. And then we pray for those who are waiting um, to go and see doctors after results and we dedicate both Anita and um, Natasha to you that you would, would um, help them and bless those, those um, medical practitioners to know exactly what and how to help uh, for the healing. Dear Lord, we, we thank you that we can also pray that you would help us to be ready for the next term so that we can serve you even better as we learn how, how to, do, to live according to your will. But now for this morning, we want to dedicate Anita to you and your word and your spirit and pray that you would really bless us and speak to us um, in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We... Um, I first going to watch a short video about the message of today. The, the theme for today is, Do You Love Me? And um, this is especially also for the children. Um, but I want to urge the, the adults, please watch closely because you're going to need that information during the service. So it's a, a kid's moment now, the, the short video, and then Andita will uh, lead us in the sermon. Peter was restless. I'm going fishing, he told the other disciples. At least fishing was doing something. It had been a while since Jesus had been crucified. He had appeared to them twice since his resurrection. It had been wonderful to see him and to know that he was alive. Jesus hadn't mentioned that Peter had denied him three times. Peter was still so embarrassed. He was ashamed of what he had done. He may have asked God to forgive him. He may have thought that Jesus would no longer trust him. 
How much did the other disciples know about it? He may have wondered. Did they know how sorry he was? Some of the other disciples decided to go fishing with Peter. So just as the sun was going down, they stepped into Peter's boat. The wind soon swept across the water. They stayed out all night, but they caught nothing. What a waste of a night's work, Peter probably thought. Early in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, they returned to shore without any fish. As their boat drew closer to shore, they noticed a man standing on the beach. The man called out, Have you caught any fish? The disciples called back, No, none at all. The man called out again, Throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. Perhaps they just wanted to please the man. Perhaps they wanted to try once more. Whatever the reason, they did what the man said. Immediately, their nets were full of fish. They couldn't even haul their nets into the boat. Suddenly, John recognized the man and called to Peter. It is the Lord! Peter was very happy to see Jesus again. Jesus was waiting for them. The boat was so very close to shore that Peter decided not to wait. He jumped out of the boat and hurried through the water to Jesus. The others followed in the boat. When they reached the shore, they found that Jesus had made a fire. He was cooking fish for their breakfast. They soon enjoyed fish and some bread. After breakfast, Jesus turned to Peter. Do you truly love me more than these? He asked. Peter immediately answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus looked into Peter's eyes and said quietly, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked, Peter, do you truly love me? And again, Peter replied, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replied, Take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter didn't know what to think. Perhaps he wondered if Jesus didn't believe him. And why did Jesus ask three times? Was it because Peter denied Jesus three times? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times. With a heavy heart, Peter answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said again, Take care of my sheep. Finally, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. Peter realized then Jesus had forgiven him. Jesus still wanted Peter to follow him. Thank you so much. I hope the, the grown-ups also watched carefully because we are going to have a um, look at that this morning, at that specific part where Jesus speaks to Peter. But first, um, I was... Let me just get this one thing on. Next slide. and we go. To, there we go. Um, last Sunday, we um, celebrated... Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And during the week, um, I had the grandkids with me, and Henry asked quite a few questions. On Friday, he wanted to know why, um, why are we saying Jesus is dead? Because he's not dead, and I have to explain, but we're doing it in parts, because on Sunday morning, we're only going to talk about the resurrection. And then he, was, and then he also asked me, but, but why, you know, why did Jesus come back? It's like, and then I realized, intellectually, we know that, there was 40 days before Jesus um, finally went up to heaven. But why? Um, do we know why? Jesus defeated death. He fulfilled um, his work, his calling. So why didn't he go to heaven immediately? I would have. No one wanted him here. I mean, if you, if you look at, at, the, at what happened on that Friday and the trial, 
Why didn't he go back? Why did he stay on for 40 more days? Um, and what was he doing during those 40 days? Um, and, and I thought, it's important that we have to understand the need for this. I don't know why this thing isn't working. There we go. So when we look at the 40 days, um, the, the number 40 holds a great significance um, throughout the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's a time, usually a time of testing or a time of preparation or a, a time of transformation. So whenever there's 40 days happening or going on, we know that there's a change coming. And that's really important that we have to keep that in mind. So a few examples of that is, um, if we look at the Old Testament, we'll see it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, and during that fly, flood, everyone was wiped out except for Noah and his family. Um, also, Moses spent 40 days on, the, on Mount Zion before he came back with the Ten Commandments. Um, and then the Israelites wandered for 40 years through the desert because they were... Um, they didn't listen. They didn't follow God's commands. And then in the New Testament, when we get there, it, it, the 40 days is also carried over to the New Testament because we see that Jesus was tempted for 40 days um, before he began his ministry. You remember he was tempted in the desert? It was also for a period of 40 days before he started his ministry. And then now again we see he stayed on earth for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. So... Um, there was, there was two reasons, I think, uh, for this 40 days that Jesus stayed. The one was to prove that he was alive. Because people, although he said he would rise after three days, they, they saw that the Roman authorities killed him. They saw that he was closed into a tomb. And, and some people turned away and thought, and this is over. So he wasn't the Messiah. So he had to come back and prove to them that he's still alive, that everything that he said was true. Um, there was a few people that he... That he um, you want? This thing doesn't work, okay? I'm not going to try anymore. There was a few people that he came to and that he, he appeared to. The first was uh, Mary Magdalene um, at the tomb that when the two of them went on the Sunday morning. After that, we see the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then the ten disciples behind locked doors because they were scared. They were locked behind closed doors. And then because Thomas wasn't there, he came to Thomas. He, he, he appeared to Thomas. And now we, this morning we saw he, he appeared to the seven disciples on the boat. And then specifically he spoke to Peter. And if we, if we do a study about that, we'll see in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6, we see that the last time that he appeared was to more than 500 people that he came, that was just before his ascension. And these appearances are proof of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and it was to fulfill the prophecies. But this morning, I don't want to talk about that too much. I want us to focus on, on, the, on when he, he appeared to the seven disciples, and specifically to Simon Peter. And I'm going to read for us from John 21, verse 1 to 19. We're just going to read verse 1 to 3, and then from verse 14 forwards. It's on the screen, yes. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. So, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And there, Peter is falling back into old habits. You just saw he was bored. You know, it was taking too long. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. And we saw in that video that they really tried, and it was traumatic for them because they were fishermen. They were used to doing this. That, that was the way that they lived before they, they started following Jesus. But they caught nothing. And then we read in verse 14. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead, after he'd spoken to the seven and he had breakfast with them. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him for the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to Peter, follow me. So this morning, I don't want to talk about the, um, the lamb and the sheep and the fact, um, the calling that, that God gave, or that Jesus gave um, Peter on that morning. I want to talk about the fact that this must have been a very uh, strange moment in Peter's life. We all know about Peter. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. He was the first um, apostle ordained by him. He was originally, originally named Simon. He was a Jewish fisherman. Both Peter and his brother Andrew were fishing when Jesus called him to follow him. And we also know that Peter was a, a guy that wasn't shy to say what he thinks and to act it. So he was, he was um, they've got a very uh, nice word, English word, boisterous. So it, it means, you know, he, was, he did a lot of the things that he wanted to and he didn't listen very closely. But then... If you can remember, um, Jesus had a conversation with Peter and he said, I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter. And if you uh, translate the word Peter, it, it can be translated to rock because you will be the rock on which I build my church. Do, do you guys remember that? So this is now the same Peter that in the Gospels are portrayed as a man that's speaking his mind and that's acting on impulse. He's, he will make bold statements and, he, will, and he, he wasn't scared to say what he thinks. Um, three of the bold statements that he made about Jesus um, was, interestingly, uh, was that by the end of Jesus' um, work on earth. In John 13, verse 37, we read that uh, Peter said, I would lay my life down for you. Um, there is a slide with that on your one. After, yeah. I would lay my life down for him. Then in Matthew 26, we read, even if anyone else or everyone else should fall away, I would never fall away. That was one of the promises that he made. He also said, even if I had to die, I would never disown Jesus. You remember those words? And then we all know what happened. After Jesus was um, put on trial, while they were in that, um, I think it was before the, the Jewish... Um, uh, uh, preachers, or what do we call them, Kara? The board, yeah. Be be before them, um, the, someone came and they said, but I know him. And three times, Peter said, no, you must be mistaken. And that happened three times before the rooster crowed. And Jesus warned him about that. So this is the background of Peter. This is the background of Jesus meeting Peter now. That was the last interaction that they had. And, and, we, and I think if we look at that, we must assume that Peter thought that his ministry was over. I mean, he, he's done this. He's denied that he knew Jesus. He's, all, all the things that he said that he would do, he didn't do any of those. He did the exact opposite. And maybe he said, you know, I'm done for. Maybe um, nothing has changed. I've, I've given my life to Jesus. I've I followed him, now he's dead, nothing's happened. And that's why they say that he, he decided to go fishing. And, and he, he decided, you know, I'll go back to what I know. I'll go back to the life that I was used to living. And that was what he did. And he took people with him. There were seven of them. And we've seen in that video that they, that they tried fishing, nothing happened. But in the end, Jesus made the difference. When Jesus came to them and said, throw the net on the other side, they called 153 fish, if you're reading the Bible. It, it was a lot. So Jesus came and Jesus made the difference. And then Jesus said to Peter, Peter, can I talk to you alone? 
Now, if you were Peter, if I was in Peter's shoes, I would have been really worried because what's going to happen now? The, Jesus knows everything. The last thing that I did is I said I don't know him. Um, and, and, Peter, and no one would have been surprised if Jesus said, Peter, I'm really disappointed in you. I'm really let down by you. You were a coward. You're all talk, but you can't walk the talk. You were supposed to be my friend. You called me, you called yourself my disciple. But when I needed you, you denied me. And would, if you, would you have been upset if Jesus said that? I don't even think Peter would have been upset because he would expect that, because that's the truth. But Jesus didn't go that route. He simply asked him, Peter, do you love me? He didn't say anything about the past. He asked him three times, do you love me? And that wasn't to rub salt in the wounds to say you denied me three times and that's why it might be. Um, he wasn't trying to inflict pain on Peter, but he was trying to relieve Peter's pain because he knew. Every time that Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, every time that he confesses that, he's also strengthening his own faith. He's also strengthening Peter's love and he is giving him the opportunity to confess the fact that he loves the Lord. And we know that this is the way that Jesus used to free Peter of this bondage of the sin that he's done. So after that conversation, Peter was free. He, he, could, he could tell everyone. He was the guy who stood up uh, and in front of 3,000 people said, Jesus is alive. You should all um, repent. He was the one that, that could take the church uh, further. But he couldn't have done that if Jesus didn't appear to him. If Je Jesus left him with all the pain, with all the, the ideas of, of that he, he couldn't do it, he wasn't good enough. If Jesus left him like that, we have, would have never heard about Peter again. But Jesus knows that Peter is the rock on which he wants to build his church. And he has to help Peter to overcome this pain and to help him to repent. Years later, we read um, in, in 1 Peter 4 verse 8, uh, Peter says, Love covers a multitude of sin. And Peter learned that firsthand from Jesus that day on the beach. It wasn't something that he didn't experience. That, therefore, he could tell us about it because he knew he experienced it himself. We, we know about Peter, the rest of Peter's life. Um, he was an evangelist, still a fisherman, but a fisher of men, not fish. And also a shepherd. He looked after the people, that um, a pastor. He looked after the people that he evangelized to. And he preached for 37 years and was 70 years old when he died. And we can stop there. I think that's fine. That's wonderful because P Peter made a miraculous U-turn and he followed Jesus. But while they were crucifying Peter, he, he gave one last testimony and he said, please, crucify me upside down because I am not worthy to die in the same way as my master did. So what changed? If you look at the way that Peter denied him and said, I don't know this man, until the day when it was Peter's death bed, he was being crucified, that he said, I'm not worthy to the same death as my master. What is it that changed? The only thing that changed was Jesus. It was Jesus that made the difference. So what kind of master or, or friend inspires devotion like this? And I'm going to read it for you. It's a friend who prayed for him when he was weak. Jesus came to Peter and he sat with him and he spoke to him and he helped him. A friend that forgave him when he failed. Jesus didn't come to Peter and say, you know what, I'm really upset with you. He said, do you love me? Because if you love me, then everything, everything will be fine. He forgave him when he failed. But he also healed a painful memory. So Peter knew what he had done. But he also, because Jesus came back and spoke to Peter, he gave him the means to go on and to forget about that pain and to go on 
in the, in the knowledge that he's doing what the Lord wants him to do. He had a friend who believed in him. Jesus knew what Peter did, but he still believed that Peter was the rock on which he will build his church. And then also, a friend like Jesus who laid his down life for him, for him because that's what Jesus did. He also laid down his life for Peter. Jesus gave Peter three, three chances to um, confess his love. And, to, and this morning, I think we have to remember that Jesus not only died for Peter on the cross, he died on the cross at Calvary for all of our sins. And in this morning, he's, he's also coming to us to ask, do you love me? Do you really love me? We have all failed at some times in our lives. We've all sinned. We've all um, thought, you know, maybe this is not worthwhile. This morning, the word comes to us. This, this um, chapter in Luke that we read comes to us to tell us that no matter what you did, no matter how many times you denied the Lord, no matter how many things you did wrong, Jesus loves you. He has paid the price for you and for me. And we, we, ha we can follow him without any, without any pain, without any fear, because the only thing that he has done is he has forgiven us. He has given us the opportunity to follow him. And in this morning, the only thing that stands between us and him and following him is the answer to the question, do you love me? Do you love him enough to make him the priority in your life? Do you love him enough to confess that in front of anyone and everyone? Do you love him enough to follow him? doesn't matter where he leads you. And that's what he's asking each and every one in this morning. And before I'm going to pray, I'm going to ask you that, that you take a few moments in silence and just, we don't have to confess it out loud, but just talk to Jesus. If you're not sure if you love him, come and talk to us afterwards so that we can, we can help you. But if you do love him, if you know that you love him, just tell him that and tell him that you are willing to make him the first priority in your life. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, when you come to us in this morning to ask us, do you love me? You do not ask us, have you done Bible study? Have you been to church? Have you been good to your neighbors? You do not ask us to give you a list of the things that we've done that we think we have done for you. You ask us, do we love you? And in this morning, we want to confess, Father, that our love is nothing in comparison to your love. You are the, the perfect example of love. And we want to say, we love you, Lord. But please help us to love you unconditionally, to love you with the, in the same way that you love us, and to show that love in the way that we live. We know we can't do it on, your, on our own. And therefore we pray, Holy Spirit, will you please fill us? Will you please guide us? Will you please help us to be living witnesses of your love, your kindness, and your mercy? Amen. So in, to close the service, or the sermon, we're going to sing the power of your love. And... Um, Please use this song as well, uh, to confess your love to the Lord. Let's rise and then we sing together. Oh, 
I just have a few announcements to make. Um, the first announcement is our new theme for the second term. It's, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. There's 11 weeks in the second term, so it works perfectly. So we're going to have, as we've done with the, um, with the Apostles' Creed last term, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments and what it practically means to each and every one of us. The second one is just a story. Those of you that think um, that, you know, maybe you've missed a gap, there's still time for you to, to uh, catch up. Um, we're only going to start reading chapter 8 
in the week of um, the 15th of April, which is next week. So you still have this week to catch up. I thought I was just, I'm also a bit behind. So um, let me just, uh, it, you know, ensure you, we, you'll be fine. So we're only starting to read chapter 8 in the week of the 15th of April. And then before I um, do the blessing, Harriet, you wanted to say something about the chairs. Thank you, Anita. I also wanted to say something about that, that's right, the, the oh, flowers. Okay. When I came to pray just now and I forgot about that, and that is, I've noticed again how many people uh, put in the flowers. Know that those flowers are only for the months of February and March. Mm. Um, uh, and this is part of our, of our service. If God has answered your prayers, you are welcome any time during the service to come and put a flower in the bowl just to acknowledge him that he answers prayers. And, and it's, so, it's, it's actually encouraging one another to pray and to trust him. Um, but according, uh, or in connection with the chairs, um, the, w the management of Billabong has asked us to try to protect this um, floor covering by not, um, what is it, sleep, what is sleep, <laughs> pulling, <laughs> dragging the chairs on, on, the, on the floor. So what we suggest, um, we stack the chairs here from, from that uh, speaker pole, 888. So if you could just stack eight any place where you are working and leave it there, the guys that set up, they will bring the trolley and they will move it to the place. So you don't have to move it. We can just make stacks. If you want to start one close there, you could do that. It's not necessary. And then they will move it. So let's try to to uh, protect the, the, the chair of the, the floor yes. in that way and also help one another with stacking the chairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Um, our blessing today is from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. And um, before I, I do the blessing, I, I would just love to give you an encouragement. Jesus showed us his love. And, and that's all I ask of you, to love him unconditionally. So make that your priority. Not all the other things that can so easily distract us from that, but make that your priority. And then I want to greet you with a blessing in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thanks so much, and you're welcome to come and join us for a coffee.